On this Friday night, Russian forces expand their bombardments. A new airstrikes into western Ukraine as Russian forces close in on Kyiv. And the hundreds of volunteers preparing essential supplies. Anxiety about retaliation as sanctions keep piling up against Russia. They're going to try and take the necessary steps to ensure that the businesses are able to go forward. And the Kremlin's latest false claims about Ukraine. Two years of a pandemic, what we have lost and what we have learned, and a haven for job hunters. Candidates are getting multiple offers. The extraordinary lengths employers are going to lure the best workers. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There are lots of threads to the Russian war in Ukraine tonight, including signs Russian forces are widening their attacks. The aerial campaign is now extending further into Ukraine, targeting cities in the West that until now had been free of bombardment. And satellite images of a convoy of military vehicles that appeared stalled near Kyiv now show it's dispersed. U.S. and British intelligence say it appears Russian forces are resetting and redeploying. Russia has gained some ground. The sections in red on this map are areas under Russian control. Several cities, including Kharkiv, are encircled, and the arrows show where Russian forces are advancing, including towards the capital, Kyiv. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky posted another video today. He says it's impossible to say how long it will take, but that the fight will be over soon. We have already reached a strategic turning point, he says. We are moving towards our goal, towards our victory. Mike Armstrong is in western Ukraine, and he begins our coverage tonight. The first attack of this war to hit the city of Lutsk came in darkness. Videos posted to social media show multiple large explosions just after 5.30 a.m. local time. The city's mayor posted a message to residents on Facebook saying three missiles hit near the airfield, four Ukrainian soldiers were killed and six injured. About an hour later, 215 kilometers south, more missile strikes. These ones in the city of Ivano-Frankivsk. Now, it wasn't the first attack for that city. It was also hit on the first day of the invasion. This was video of that strike. But since then, things have been fairly quiet. The city's been a staging area for supplies to be sent to the front in eastern Ukraine. It's also been a safer place for thousands who fled the fighting. The mayor says two people were injured, no one was killed. But he says the missile attack wasn't just about the airfield. It was also about morale in western Ukraine. It's safe territory for Ukraine, and that's why uh, Russia uh, wants to, um, to have a panic in uh, our people. Now, we've been asked not to show any of the fortifications in the city's downtown, but we were invited into this supply depot. It's a group of volunteers, about 550 men and women, running shifts day and night. The group also has about 100 former Ukrainian servicemen, something that helps get the food and supplies directly to the front, even when there's danger. This man is one of the organizers. In recent years, they've been shipping 20 to 30 tons of supplies every month. In the last two weeks, they've shipped 600 tons. Now, the Russian offensive also expanded in the east. The city of Dnipro was hit for the first time. Three missiles struck an area around a chemical factory, killing at least one. Dnipro is Ukraine's fourth biggest city, the major industrial hub. It's also another place where people have gone, thinking it was safer. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Ivano Frankivs, Ukraine. A new life born in the midst of war. This is one of the women who was pictured struggling down the stairs of that bombed maternity hospital in Mariupol, still dressed in the same spotted pajamas. She has given birth to a baby girl who is said to be healthy. The situation in Mariupol, Ukraine says, is now critical. Russian forces continue to relentlessly bomb the city. Ukraine says almost 1,600 civilians have died, and those who are still alive have been without power or water for more than a week. Attempts to take the capital have so far failed. Russia is now changing tactics, and the country's defense minister told Vladimir Putin today everything is going to plan. 
Jackson Prosco reports. Russia's military released video claiming to show its forces moving near Ukraine's capital, where residents are shoring up defenses, stocking up and preparing for an invasion. Target is capital of Ukraine. Target is Kyiv. We're ready to defend our city. The remarkable strength of the Ukrainians and stalled Russian advances have left Kyiv relatively untouched. That likely won't last. This is going to be an extremely brutal battle if Russia decides to hold a sort of the siege and try to move in force. Desperation may drive increasingly brutal measures from the Kremlin. The risk of this is very real. Russia summoned a meeting of the UN Security Council to warn without proof that Ukraine is planning biological or chemical weapons attacks. False claims that could provide cover for Russia's use of such weapons against Ukraine. Today the world is watching Russia do exactly what we warned it would. And now Putin is looking to expand that war. He met with the puppet leader of Belarus Friday. The Ukrainians allege that during that meeting, Russian jets attacked Belarusian villages. Another false flag attack meant to draw Moscow's close ally into Ukraine. And that's why Belarus might be stepping in too. They need more forces to strengthen and carry out this war of attrition. The West now has to decide how to respond to all possible scenarios. Putin is an aggressor. He is the aggressor. And Putin must pay the price. In Washington, President Joe Biden announced a coordinated G7 and EU plan to remove Russia's favored nation trading status and block more Russian imports. He issued another stark warning about Moscow's alleged plans. Russia would pay a severe price if they use chemicals. Despite those threats, NATO remains deeply wary of going too far in Ukraine. And for the first time, President Biden issued a dire warning about the potential for a third world war if there's spillover that leads to direct conflict between NATO and Russia. Donna? Jackson in Washington, thank you. Ukrainian officials say the mayor of the southern city of Melitopol has been abducted by Russian forces. In a statement, Ukraine's Ministry of Foreign Affairs says Mayor Ivan Fedorov was kidnapped earlier today after being falsely accused of terrorism. Ukraine calls it a war crime and calls on the international community to help save his life. Russia is expanding control of the information and the narrative of its war. It is restricting access to Instagram, which has millions of users in Russia, and it's opened a criminal case against Facebook's parent company, Meta. Meta temporarily changed its hate speech rules to allow Facebook and Instagram users to call for violence against Vladimir Putin and Russian soldiers. Meta says it's making allowances for forms of political expression. That's not how Russia sees it. Russian prosecutors plan to designate it an extremist organization, which would mean it would be banned in Russia. WhatsApp, though, is still up and running because it's a messaging platform, not a social network. The Canadian government is sanctioning five more Russian oligarchs who are deemed to be enabling Vladimir Putin in his war against Ukraine. They include billionaire Roman Abramovich, owner of the Chelsea Football Club, and a man with deep ties to Canada's mining industry. Abigail Beeman explains. Abramovich is one of Russia's richest and most influential oligarchs. He owns the Chelsea Football Club. The United Kingdom just moved to sanction him Thursday. Now Canada follows. Abramovich is part owner of steel company Evraz. It supplied the majority of steel used to build the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Asked about the sanctions impact for Canadians, Trudeau said the sanctions are targeted at individuals. I believe Abramovich uh, owns shares uh, that are worth a little less than 30% of uh, Evraz. Um, we are obviously going to watch carefully, but we are confident that this will not if impact the hardworking uh, Canadians who uh, are doing good work in, in companies across the country. It still isn't clear what the full impact of the sanctions will be. In addition to the five individuals, Trudeau announced new export sanctions for 32 Russian military entities so they can't buy equipment from Canadians. The list includes the Foreign Intelligence Service and aircraft and helicopter companies. We need to continue to remain firm and united uh, in demonstrating our resolve and our deep conviction that Vladimir Putin has made a terrible mistake and will end up losing despite how many bombs he can drop on hospitals or perhaps even because of it. There is no win in this for him. 
however long it takes. Trudeau has been asked several times this week about how Canada can help Europe with oil and gas. Europe is dependent on Russian supply, with many countries wanting to cut ties. Trudeau was clearest Friday, saying Canada doesn't have the infrastructure necessary to replace Russian energy here on European soil, but is talking with allies about what role Canada could potentially play going forward. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Warsaw. Well, the Prime Minister says Canadian sanctions against Russian oligarchs will have little impact here on companies. There are concerns the wealthy businessmen might still be able to retaliate. Jamie Dahl reports. Roman Abramovich is a billionaire businessman and former Russian politician with ties from Vladimir Putin back to Boris Yeltsin. He made much of his fortune after the fall of the Soviet Union. He's also a shareholder in Evra's, the steel producer that employs more than 1,800 people in Canada, with three production sites in Alberta and one in Saskatchewan. You need to have this company function because it's making all the pipe, not just for the Trans Mountain Pipeline, it makes a fair amount of it. But the oil patch, oil patch, as you know, is is doing better now, and you need this pipe uh, in the you know in the short term, I guess, to to complete a number of projects. Abramovich owns 29 percent of shares in the company. Britain has also frozen his assets, and 10 of the company's board of directors have resigned. While both the company and Canada's prime minister try to quell any fear the sanctions could hurt employees of Evra's in this country. Others say there could be ramifications. It's hard to say with any certainty, but I have no doubt that they're going to try and take the necessary steps to ensure that the businesses are able to go forward and that the oligarchs aren't able to retaliate by, say, closing down the business or, or trying to hurt us in, 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 real, in retaliation. And that, of course, remains a possibility. In a statement, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe said his government is in contact with Ottawa and Saskatchewan has been assured the sanctions will not negatively impact the mill there. Moe said he will continue to engage with the federal government to ensure that continues to be the case. Alberta's energy minister says it's too soon to say. We have to probably wait and see how that unfolds and wait to see how some of these uh, sanctions unfold before we know the impact. In Alberta, we're, we have started to look at all of the oil and gas leases to determine if there is Russian ownership of, of some of the oil and gas wells in Alberta and see what can be done about that. NATO leaders continue to insist sanctions are making an impact overseas. It's less clear just how the ripple effects may be felt here. Jamie Dahl, Global News, Calgary. The family of Saudi blogger Raif Badawi says he has been released from a Saudi prison. Ensaf Hadar lives with the couple's three children in Quebec. She was granted asylum in Canada after her husband's arrest in 2012. She tweeted today, Badawi is free. In 2014, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and 1,000 lashes on charges he insulted Islam on his blog. His family says the conditions of his release are not yet clear. The pursuit for the perfect employee. Coming up, the unconventional ways companies are wooing workers. Statistics Canada says unemployment is now at pre-pandemic levels. 337,000 new jobs were added in February, dropping the unemployment rate to 5.5%. Sectors hardest hit by COVID-19, like restaurants and hotels, have rebounded, adding 114,000 new jobs last month. There are now more jobs than people to fill them, and as Anne Gaviola reports, some companies are pulling out all the stops to entice people to work for them. It's a job seeker's market right now. Across many industries, levels of skill and experience. Recruiters say the war for talent is cutthroat. And I have not seen that kind of competition in, that, in 20 years. It's really, really tight. Candidates are getting multiple offers. Employers are taking unusual steps to try to stand out. Foodshare Toronto is offering prospective workers $75 if they make it to the interview stage because it's a labour-intensive process. Research, there's the practicing, there's the, the commute, there's finding childcare. The nonprofit also offers hourly compensation for assignments related to hiring. No freebies. Employers have, to be quite frank, have been getting off scot free for a long time. 
Canada currently has a high number of job vacancies and relatively low unemployment, meaning more job openings and not enough qualified workers to fill them. Now, this labor squeeze tends to get worse as COVID restrictions lift. And right now, recruiters say we're in the midst of an ultra competitive wave. This employment expert says interview processes have gotten shorter. So has the time between a job interview and an offer. The best are getting it done in a week. Um, I certainly wouldn't advise any organization to go beyond two weeks. Companies aren't just listing a position's duties and responsibilities anymore. They now have to sell themselves as a great place to work. So the candidate attraction process has changed greatly. And um, right now, the employees or the candidates are certainly the ones with the power. With gas prices at record highs, flexible work schedules are in demand. And the number one question that we do get asked all the time is, can I work from home for this position? And uh, they're looking for a hybrid model. Workers who aren't happy where they are have a lot of opportunities in this environment. And the onus is on employers to be strategic and do what they can to retain their best and brightest or risk losing them. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. The Conservative leadership race is on ahead. What direction will the party go? More candidates are lining up to take a shot at the federal Conservative leadership. Four people have said they're in the running so far, including former Quebec Premier Jean Charest and Ontario MP Pierre Polyev. Eric Sorensen looks at what it might take not just to win the leadership, but to win over voters. Jean Charest, the former progressive conservative, believes the current conservatives must expand their appeal and that he's the one to unite the party and the country. This is something that we owe to the citizens of the country that is embedded in the history of our party. And that's to be a national political party able to bring the country together. Can Charest repeat the success of his former boss, Brian Mulroney, who swept the country, including Quebec, which conservatives have not done since? The rule is that usually Quebecers will tend to vote for a Quebec leader. Would it help to make inroads in Quebec? Absolutely. Pierre Polyev is a product of the modern Conservative Party. This page, blacked out. He this torments page. the Liberals and promises a distinctly Conservative agenda. The Polyev government will make life more affordable by eliminating the federal carbon tax on gas, heat and groceries. This supporter suggests Polyev will appeal to social conservatives and all conservatives. And social conservatives just want to be respected and heard. Uh, the winner of this leadership will be the candidate who appeals to the broadest spectrum of party members. Also joining the race this week with his video, MP Leslin Lewis, who placed a strong third in the last leadership race. The Prime Minister needs to take responsibility for his failed leadership. So the field is taking shape with Polyev, Charest and Lewis also running Ontario MPP Roman Baber, and expected to jump in this weekend, Brampton, Ontario Mayor Patrick Brown, the former Ontario Progressive Conservative leader. And we are deciding the future of this party and potentially this country. I think that the party is at an inflection point. Um, I think it's got to figure out what direction it's going to go. Conservatives are itching for another crack at Justin Trudeau, who has beaten them three times. But no prime minister in 100 years has won four consecutive elections, which means Canada's next prime minister could well emerge from this bruising conservative leadership race. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Next, the losses and lessons after two years of the pandemic. Time has felt elastic since COVID-19 dominated our lives, so it's kind of hard to believe it was two years ago today that we led the newscasts with this. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The World Health Organization has now confirmed what many epidemiologists have been saying for weeks. The coronavirus is a pandemic. All experts agree this is going to get worse. Well, they were right, of course. Everything changed. Over the last two years, the virus is estimated to have killed more than six million people. We have vaccines now and public health restrictions are lifting. It doesn't feel like an emergency anymore, but it's still with us. Tonight, Jamie Marocker looks at what we've learned and are still learning. For the first time since surviving severe COVID-19 last March, Matthew Cardinal went back to the Regina Hospital that saved his life. It was hard for me to go to the hospital. It was very hard. Going to a place where you're dying, basically, it was traumatizing. 
Left with long-haul symptoms, his future with the virus remains unclear, as so many others move to put this pandemic in the past. From the direction we're going in now, um, I wouldn't say we're nearing the end, but I, I think there are many ways in which we can see the end. That's not necessarily the end of the world. We spend every day of our lives living with viruses that once caused pandemics. Influenza, the 1918 Spanish flu, was the deadliest pandemic on record, but thanks to herd immunity and medication, it fizzled out. In the late 1980s, there was HIV AIDS, but modern treatments have made it a manageable disease. 2009's H1N1 outbreak is often called the forgotten pandemic, thanks to technical advancement, surveillance and treatments that quelled it so quickly. Montreal microbiologist Donald Vinn says really only smallpox and possibly SARS, which hit Toronto hard in the early 2000s, have been eradicated. What's likely going to happen with SARS-CoV-2 may be similar to what we saw with the 1918 influenza, which is that there was a peak amount of activity over a certain number of years that eventually decreased through a variety of both viral biology and medicine and public health measures. Leaving us to coexist with COVID. To get there, experts say we can't repeat history. We need to focus on our failing healthcare systems and build up capacity, communicate public health measures clearly to further avoid pandemic fatigue, put in place proper data collection, which we've failed to prioritize, and continue to vaccinate, test, contact trace, and surveil. As much as many people want to believe this is over, this is not over. Um, there will be subsequent waves. The question here is, how and to what extent will those impact us in Canada? The answer may lie in what we've learned and how we respond as a collective. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. Well, I never imagined two years ago that we'd still be affected by the pandemic. It has been a long two years. We leave you tonight with a look back at some moments. <laughs> From paying tribute to healthcare workers to the rollout of vaccines, we've all had to mourn, to adapt, to learn, and to live with a new kind of normal. That's Global National for this Friday. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on Saturday for the new reality. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.